Welcome everyone to our second lecture today, PC 212 Christian Apologetics. We, um, we started talking about the third reason for suffering. We're talking about uh, satanic oppression, the things that the devil does. And we were just looking at the Old Testament incident of Job and what happened there that it was Satan who did everything to Job but there was also a problem from Job's side which was he had great fear great dread that these very kinds of these same things would happen to him so you know so the question is uh, one question came up during the break time did God allow Satan to do this? Answer is yeah. But why did he allow it? Well, the same reason you and I are here on the earth, and the devil is God has allowed the devil to be around. There are demons around. So has God allowed the devil to be around? Has he allowed the demons to be around? Yeah. But he has given us something: the shield of faith. He's given us weapons to use. In Job's case, Job could have also had faith right, in God. But he didn't have the Bible that we have. right? So we have a big advantage. We have the Bible, we can read, we understand things now. We are in a much better place of revelation than Job. But faith today, faith in God works the same way all the time, meaning in Bible times or now, same way. It has the same effect. Faith is our shield. But if you don't have faith and you have fear, fear is an open door to the devil. Faith is a shield against the devil. That means the door is closed. Fear is the opposite. The door is open. There's no shield. There's no defense. Right? That was what, what was happening in Job's case. But anyway, uh, we know in Job's case, everything worked out. Meaning, uh, at, at, at the end of that time of you know trouble, Job turned to God. Uh, God taught Job how to forgive his friends, how to pray for his friends. And God turned everything around for Job. So God did good things, even though the devil did bad things. He turned everything up. In... Paul's case, so now we come into the New Testament, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 1 to 10. And uh, we will just look at a part of that scripture, 2 Corinthians 12. And uh, I think it's important for us to understand this, that because many people use Paul and um, uh, Paul was, again, an apostle of Jesus. A devout follower of Jesus. And yet, he had what he refers to as a thorn in the flesh. But what is this? What was this thorn in the flesh? What was it actually? So, 2 Corinthians 12, 7, Paul says, And lest I should be exalted above measure, by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities or weaknesses, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and needs in persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, what is this thorn in the flesh? Okay. So some people read this passage, ah, see, Paul had a thorn in the flesh. What was it? Then they will cross-reference other places. Galatians, he said, I have written this letter with big. I have written this letter with big letters. Oh, so maybe he had eye problem. 
another place they say uh, he said i know you galatians you would have gladly given your hand for me or oh, maybe one of his hand was problem <laughs> so, but he's just using phrases you know like we say pain in the neck or we say you know uh, you would have done this for me you know i'll die for you not really going to really, literally going to die <laughs> it's just his expression of saying something that you know you mean so much to me kind of thing so people take those things and say okay maybe paul had a eye problem he had a hand problem or some sickness or some but actually right here in verse 7 he says what his problem was he says there was given to me a thorn in the flesh what was it a messenger of satan a messenger the word messenger is a greek word angelos which is a neutral word it means angel so when we say that word angel angelos angel angelos is a greek word it can mean god's angel angelos is also used for demons that means devil's angels angelos is also used for preachers of the gospel messengers of the gospel it's a neutral word depends on the context whether it's satan's angel god's angel or a messenger a preacher angelos a bringer of news it's a neutral word so he was an angelos of satan really say okay so that thorn in the flesh is a phrase it's also found in the old testament where it says uh, the old testament uh, i forget the exact reference but in the old testament the phrase thorn in the flesh is used and it's talking about the the tribes the enemies of israel will be a thorn in your flesh your enemies will be a thorn in the flesh he's talking about in that case in the old testament is referring to people this people will be a thorn in your flesh so it's not like some sickness in your body in the old testament case it's the enemies your people are going to be thorn in the flesh here what was a thorn in the flesh it was a angelic being of satan an angelos of satan a messenger of Satan. That was that angelic being was like a thorn in the flesh, causing trouble. What kind of trouble? He mentions right here, verse ten. It is coming with weakness, with reproach, with needs, with persecutions, with distress. That means this angel is trying to attack Paul with everything he's got. Trying to put sickness. Trying to put. um reproach shame bring need persecution trouble ever all kinds of things but what was the thorn in the flesh it was actually a demonic being an angelic being trying to bring all this thing against paul okay so uh, you know people have said so many things about this thorn in the flesh but it is right there huh whether he knew had a problem or didn't have a problem nobody knows see either way we can't prove or disprove it we don't know which one yeah like from second corinthians 127 we cannot say he had a eye problem that is only an assumption only asms or head problem hand problem what problem <laughs> none of these things right he says very clearly it was a messenger of satan an angelic being to do what to buffet him buffet means to keep on coming after him buffet means like the wave of the sea the little picture there is like the wave of the sea it keeps on coming keeps on coming keeps on coming so this messenger of satan kept on coming against paul to hinder him in his work in his ministry that is what he is saying and paul realized hey 
the troubles I'm facing, it is because there is a demonic angel coming against me again, 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 trying to hurt, interrupt, disturb, cause trouble, cause distress. And Paul writes all his troubles. You know? So when he was shipwrecked, he was beaten. He, these were not things God was putting on him. There was a messenger of Satan coming against him over and over and over again, just doing all these things to prevent him from preaching the gospel. So about this demonic being, he prayed three times. God, take this fellow away. Why is this demonic being coming against me, troubling me? God, why can't you do something about it? It's like how if you and I pray, God, take the devil away. Or take this demonic demon, demonic being that's causing this, take it away. God will give us the same answer. There's a time that's coming when Satan and his angels will be cast into a lake of fire. But until that time, they are going to be here on the earth. So what is God's response to you and me? My grace is enough for you. My grace is given to you. My power is given to you. What more do you need? God is not going to take that messenger of Satan away. You and I also face messengers of Satan today. Right? We can't pray, God, take this devil away. Send this devil to hell. <laughs> no, my grace and my power is enough for you. That time will come. It's already written in Revelation. And Satan and his demons will be cast into the lake of fire. Gone. That time will come. But till then, we have to depend on his grace and on his power. Knowing that in the middle of our weaknesses, his strength is made perfect. That is when his strength shines through beautifully, when we feel weak. The other thing we must understand in verse 12, verse 7 is, the why did God allow this messenger of Satan? Why did he? So in this case, it is a very targeted attack. You know, so maybe this we don't know what level. So we know that in Satan's kingdom, there are levels of demons. It could be that this was a very powerful demon, troubling Paul. We don't know. He just said messenger of Satan. We don't know what degree, uh, or what level. But why did God allow this? And why was this targeted? It says here, lest I should be exalted above measure, verse 7, by the abundance of the revelations. That means God had given Paul so much of revelation. He had been taken into the third heavens, you know, caught up into the heaven. He describes it earlier in the beginning of chapter 12. He says, you know, I, I was caught up, verse 2, 14 years ago, I was caught up into the third heaven and I, heard, uh, I went into the paradise of God, verse 4, and I heard things that I cannot, I'm not even allowed to speak. So, you can imagine, Paul must have gone into the heaven, he must have gone to the throne room, he must have seen so much, heard so much, he said, I can't even tell you all these things. And he says, because God gave me such abundance of revelations, this messenger of Satan was troubling me. What, 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 what would the messenger of Satan gone after? Saying, we don't want Paul to release the revelation he's given. Because Satan comes for the word. He comes for the truth. To try to stop it, right? We know from the parable of the sower. Satan comes quickly to steal the... Why does he come? More word? He'll say, oh, I should go and take it out. Right? coming. God had given abundance of revelations to Paul. This messenger, Satan, wants to stop that revelation from going forth. But God is turning that around saying, Paul, just hang in there. It will keep you humble. The enemy is coming to do evil. God is saying something good will happen in you in this battle. It will keep you humble. See? So why? So that answers the question, why is God loving the devil today in the world? 
Why can't he just take the devil off? Because something good is coming in us. The devil is trying to do bad. Good things are being accomplished in us. We are being changed from glory to glory. We are being strengthened. We are being refined. If there was no devil, no battle. No battle, no strength. So the devil is saying, I'm going to go after them. I'm going to destroy them. I'm going after what God is. Well, they're only becoming stronger. So we are being prepared for greatness, for greater things. Through these battles and things that the devil has caused. So you see how things are working out, right? God has given abundance of revelations to Paul. This messenger of Satan is coming to try and stop that. But God is saying, Paul, you, my grace is there for you. My power is there for you. You stay there. And when good thing is coming out, you will keep me humble. <laughs> you will stay humble. Keep going. And this messenger did not succeed. Because in his final epistle, Paul writes, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. I finished. This messenger of Satan did not stop Paul. I finished my course. Others here have said, hey, I still have something to finish. That messenger stopped me. No. So you're writing to Timothy. I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. Now I am ready to be offered up to God. That means this messenger of Satan did not succeed in stopping Paul from doing what God wanted him to do in his life. It was there, troubled him, but good things came. Paul was kept humble. He continued and he gave the revelation. Whatever we needed to hear, Paul wrote for us. Right? Where did Paul get all this revelation? God showed it to him. He wrote it down for us. He finished his work. So, we must so we understand both these passages, Job and Paul, as look, there is a devil doing bad things. We, we acknowledge. Even believers will face bad things from the devil. Job did Old Testament, Paul did New Testament. We'll face it. The Bible tells us that. But God has given us what we need. To stand. And even in every attack of the devil, God is working something good in us. He's working something good for us. We can, we are being developed, we are being strengthened, our faith is being encouraged. You know, so that's what we must pursue. But it may be frustrating, it may be Disturbing for us, of course. It's not easy. Like Paul, he also must, God, please take this thing away. And Paul prayed. But God didn't take it away. He said, I'm giving you the grace. I'm giving you this power. Keep going. So we will face this. We may feel, you know, uh, feel the pressure of what's being done. But um, we keep moving forward. Yes, go ahead with your questions. Pastor, as the believers, uh, how unbelievers face the problems and how in their lives Saturn will work and how they overcome the problems, how the work actually happen in, in non-believers lives. Mm, 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 mm. They also face problems, they also overcome. So how all these works happens, how the problems will come to them and how it will got resolved. Because okay. people will say like, we are also facing problems, we also because of our faith, we will also overcome them. Mm, mm. Okay, interesting question. So, the Bible 
is not telling us everything, but you know, I'm trying to just think about what scriptures we can look at. One is the Bible says, you know, first John 5, verse 18. The whole world, oh, verse 18 or verse 19, first John 5. Um, Verse 19. Huh? Oh, what did I say? First John 5 19. Huh? First John 5 19. Hmm. So first John first John 5 19 says the whole world is under the control, the influence of the devil. Right? So we're talking about the non-believers. They are also affected by what the devil does. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, it says, The spirit of disobedience is at work in them. So it's moving them to do bad things and so on. Anyway, so um, they also face the consequence of sin, the temptations of the enemy, they can become in come in bondage to demonic powers, so on. Now, there are general principles that everyone can benefit from. The general principle is light removes darkness, truth removes error, good overcomes evil. These principles, just like gravity. Gravity is for everybody. You're a believer, non-believer, gravity works for you. Similarly, these principles apply. Good overcomes evil. That's a principle everyone can use. So, example, I'm just giving an example. If a non-believer faces some evil, let's say he's being troubled by some people, and he goes and does good to them, what what is the principle that will work in that situation? Good overcomes evil. He doesn't have to be a believer to apply that principle. Because these are principles. We, we could say moral principles or spiritual principles that apply for everybody. So if that non-believer does good when evil is done to him, good will overcome evil. If the non-believer speaks truth, when people are accusing him of evil, he will overcome because truth overcomes evil, uh, error, evil, untruth. Just as light overcomes darkness. There's a principle applied to everyone. Right? So even non-believers, non when they do these right things, they are going to get the benefit of these principles. It applies to everybody. On the other hand, believers, <laughs> they go do wrong things and then they try to overcome evil with evil. It doesn't work. Because they're they are not applying the principle. The principle is overcome evil with good. Yeah, so, so that, uh, do non-believers face problems? Yeah, they will also face problems. The same principles apply for them. Uh, the only thing they don't, cannot do is like you know take the revelation of the bible to fight against the devil because they don't have that they don't so they can't so they that in that space there is a disadvantage what they may do is go to witchcraft some people right so that's why they turn to witchcraft so when they turn to witchcraft to get free from evil powers or they turn to the occult to get free from evil powers or they turn to gods and goddesses to get free from evil powers. What are they doing, actually? They're tapping into degrees of demonic powers. So there are higher degrees of demonic powers that can override what lower levels of demonic powers do. So that's what Jesus said. If Satan casts of Satan, then his kingdom will fall. And that's exactly what's happening. Satan is self-destroying. Right? So in this process, of witchcraft and a cult. It's act there is a demonstration of demonic power, but it's also very self-destructive. It is Satan destroying himself. But people tap into that. 
So that's why they go to do these things, you know, whether pilgrimages or sacrifices or occult or all these things. They're tapping into the uh, higher levels of demonic power that can override, but eventually it'll be self destructive. Okay. Yeah. One more thing. Uh, when we when we are saying of all this suffering in the context of this, can we see this uh, wealth or rich? Maybe in the perspective of suffering, like some of the people will will be in rich families, will burn in rich families. Some of the people are in poor families. Uh, can we any way? Uh, uh, can we talk anyway in this in the perspective of suffering? Like we can overcome it. The um, poor. Yeah. So uh, gen about you know uh, rich rich um, wealth and poverty. What we can say is, we can say clearly that God blesses us with wealth. That's a blessing from God. It's we can Deuteronomy eight eighteen. God gives you the power to get wealth and so many other scriptures, right? So wealth is a blessing from God. Poverty, as we can see from Deuteronomy 28, it's a part of the curse. So when we help somebody come out of poverty, we're actually blessing their lives. That's, that's the work of God. When we help somebody come out of poverty. So God brings the poor out of their thing. So we are actually doing the work of God. We are actually helping them come into a place of blessing. Right? And so um, we can expect God to work in people's lives to bring them out of poverty. But remember that wealth and poverty is no indicator of the level of faith. because. James said, you know that there, there are those who are poor in this world, but they are rich in faith. So we should not make that mistake. Oh, you have so much wealth because you are so great faith. No. It may be some other reasons, like you said, they were born into that family or something else. Right. So we should not equate wealth or poverty to faith. No. Faith is something you have in God. We know that God can bless people with wealth or provision and all that. We know that God wants us to bring people out of poverty so they have enough for their needs and for their living and live well. But we want God wants us to do that, to take care of the poor and help them out. But don't make the mistake of equating faith with this wealth and Is there any reason for poverty, like how you said in Deuteronomy 28? It's because of curse. But we are, we are. I mean, uh, we are not under the curse, right? Because of Jesus Christ. Then how come people are uh, uh, living in poverty? I mean, when we when we see this verse, it's because of curse. But we, because of Jesus Christ, we are not in poverty. Yes. Yeah. Uh, out of the curse. Out yeah. of the curse. So how come people are still believers? You're saying believers. Yeah, believers or non. -be okay, believers will take believers. How come they are uh, still in poverty, or, or the people who are about to come now they are in poverty, burning in poverty? Like if you take these these things are in the context. See, one is, uh, let's say, uh, people are there are people who are living in different conditions. Right. So people are born, they're automatically born into that immediate environment into which they are born. So it's not their fault, anything. They're born into that. But once they become believers, they can expect God to lift them out of that place. How God works, He'll work differently in different people's lives. But we need to help people, saying, See, we have a practical responsibility also. That means 
God said, you go and work and you, you know, you do those things. That was the practical responsibilities. We have to do that. We have to earn wealth. We have to do the right thing. But we can believe God to bring us out of that place. But that truth has to be given to the people, including believers. Sometimes believers are given the wrong information that poverty is a sign of spirituality. Stay like this. God wants you to be like this. That's wrong, that's wrong information. Actually, if you read the Bible, poverty is given under the curse, not under the blessing. Under the blessing, he said, I will bless your basket and your store. I'll bless you when you come and I'll bless you when you go out. You'll have more than enough. You will lend to others. You will not borrow. That is the blessing. So we have to teach people, hey, God can bring you out of this. He can put, he can put you in a good place. You believe God. You work. You do your part. Trust God and come out. And then generation after generation will become better and better. Yeah. Just like any, any other probation we have to. If somebody wants to stay like that, that is their choice. Because I know the word of God, but if we see practically, maybe we can we can we can sit and discuss all these things. If we, if we, if we, it comes to the practicality things and all, it won't be happen, right? Why? That is where faith comes in. <laughs> no, seriously, seriously, God can step can do something unusual. I'm not saying how God works. He can work in so many ways. So you can imagine this person, he becomes a believer, he looks to God, and then God sends somebody there to his life. They say, hey, I will provide for your education. Then he goes and gets educated. Then he gets a good job. And then he does, and these are so many stories we hear like this, no? God can give an idea, they do something. So, so many things happen. And... Uh, and there are so many stories like this. I can tell you, like at APC. Um, now this is about how many? Uh, about seventeen years ago, one young man. I mean, he just young means he just. I think he had just got married. This early stage in life, he came. At that time, he was broke. Very sad state. Without a job, bro, he used to come and sit in church, the back. Sit in the last row, quietly listen and go. God started working. Uh, he got a job in a kind of like a very small, like small company. And I, I knew all the people there who started that company. And this is 17 years ago. Uh, I think uh, to... All four of them used to visit APC. Um, two of them were committed, like part of APC, and other two were in other churches. He started the work. Today, the company has become so big. Three of them are living. Uh, two of them are living over. Two of them are living overseas. Companies become very big. All of them are like own houses, cars, this, that, everything. And literally, I saw how God uh, worked in their lives, lifted them up. Yeah. So it's an amazing story, you know. Um, so God, and like, there's so many, so many examples where people come. And I was actually thinking about this the other day, where how important education is, because and I, again, I've seen other people. Their, their immediate family is still living in the village. They are here in the city, 
having owning a home and a car and all of that. So they have really made the change, the transition. And some of them are believers, have seen God do this in their lives. It's amazing that they have made that shift. So can God do it? Yeah, he can. Now, uh, just to clarify, we're not differentiating people. We're not deciding on their faith or spirituality based on wealth. And I think we should not do that. But we know that God can bring us out or bring people out of that place of poverty. Bless them. All right, Chaya's question. When one suffers because of uh, they are humble and meek, even when they're doing what is right in the eyes of God, then is this suffering from Satan? Well, uh, not always. Sometimes it could be, sometimes it could be suffering from Satan, but like we're going to see in the next point, it could be suffering caused by other people, by the wickedness of man itself, right? So we may walk in humility and kindness and goodness, but people can be evil to us. So there's the enemy that does bad things to us, but there are also people who are evil. Uh, so inherently, people are could be evil, wicked. So people, some suffering happens because people are being wicked to us. All right, so let's go on to the next point. Um, you have a question, Prince? Yes, go ahead. Uh, like uh, we have seen uh, about Job and Paul, mm -hmm. and from Paul, like we have seen, like enemy is after us. Like uh, he wants to uh, attack us or uh, he wants to oppress us, mm -hmm. but uh, like he is after us. Yeah. And uh, in Job case, we have uh, seen that it's like we have. Uh, we seen that it's because of his fears uh it happened to him but like uh but in the paul case but it was not mentioned like he was he yeah. had any fears so and uh, in job chapter one uh it also gives us a like the conversation happens between uh jesus God and, and satan, satan. Yeah. Uh, so like uh is it uh because of fear something happens or uh, is it normally is like uh can we like can we say in the job case like it's because of fears of job it was happened or can we also say like it's because uh, he was prospering that's why devil has uh, attacked or uh, did everything mm. so try to understand the question can we say that the devil attacked Job because he was doing well? I mean, if you read chapter 1, Job chapter 1, God commends Job's uh, devotion. He says, he tells the devil, you know, haven't you seen my servant Job? You know, how he is. He's walking with righteousness. And, um. But what actually prompted Satan to go after Job? Why didn't he go go after Job's neighbor? No. <laughs> Why didn't he go after some other person? Why did he go after Job? What prompted Satan to go after? Um, I don't. I mean, it doesn't tell us necessarily what prompted that. Maybe, and we can only. I know I would say I call this speculation. That means we're only imagining. We don't know for sure. Maybe it was Job because of Job's devotion to God. Maybe because uh, God brought it up and said, "Hey, look at one of my people." You know, there could have been many people like Job who loved God, but God brought it. then Satan said, "Okay, let's test and see if this is really he's is he serving you for nothing." Or is he serving you because you're blessing him with all these things? Let's really test it out. So maybe that led to, I mean, I, these, are all, these are all just imagination, right? I'm not saying this is the exact way it happened. But this is information you have in chapter 1. But this was the kind of conversation that went on. And then Satan went in trouble, Job. What really caused that, we don't know. But we know that Job had fear, which allowed these things to happen in his life. Which kept an open door. 
not because of the fear it happened, but it kind of opened the door for the enemy to work. Work in his life. Yes, go ahead. Like, uh, uh, from the statement that uh, Paul says, uh, I was given a thorn in my flesh, and uh, he tells about like the uh, weaknesses. Yeah, but then. Uh, he tells like uh, he writes. Uh, I delight in my weaknesses. Hardship. Yeah. Yes. And also, like, uh, there, are, there, are, there are times, or uh, there are some people who uh, literally like uh, applies it. Like uh, when it, we actually don't know what uh, Paul is telling about the weakness that he is mentioning. Mm. He tells about weakness, but uh, there are some people like they literally take the weaknesses of their flesh for the okay. desires of the flesh and they use it in that context. So oh, you're saying they apply this to weakness of the flesh. So if the weakness of flesh is drinking, okay, I will drink a lot of alcohol. I take yeah, pleasure in this weakness. God, is that uh, what they say? Yeah. Something like uh, with everything of if they are greedy or if they are angry, mm. if uh, they want to do some smoking or drinking, all mm -hmm. these weaknesses mm -hmm. of the flesh. Mm -hmm. uh, they used to tell like his grace will be sufficient, and people used to apply it and used to quote it. They're and, very smart. <laughs> <laughs> and also in uh, first uh, year, we have learned that like uh, this was a. Uh, Especially for uh, uh, Paul's case, because he was given with more uh, revelation. Yes. So it was only, but but we can't take it and apply to a, like, God was given me a thorn of flesh. Yes. We can't tell it. Yeah. So that application that you just shared, right? Like somebody taking this. Second Corinthians uh, 12, 10, and maybe this whole incident and saying, oh, therefore, I will take pleasure in my weakness. My weakness is drinking. My weakness is this, this, all the wrong things uh, because God is giving me more grace like that. That is a misapplication of scripture, right? So what we should do, all scripture must be interpreted in the light of the rest of scripture. We cannot take this one passage or one verse and, no, what does the rest of scripture say? The rest of scripture says you must crucify the flesh. The rest of scripture says we must walk in holiness. The rest of scripture says there are things that God does not approve. Right? So I can't take 2 Corinthians 12, 10 and say, oh, I will take pleasure in my weakness and whatever your weakness is. No, there are some weaknesses that have to be crucified, that have to be dealt with. You know, So we have to interpret scripture with the rest of scripture and then apply it in our lives. Okay. So let's try to just do one more, see a few more minutes and then. So the other reason why, um, which we will consider now, why there is suffering is it's due to other people's actions, including persecution. Right? So um, Peter's epistle, Peter wrote this epistle, first and second Peter. He wrote this epistle to the Jewish Christians who had been scattered outside of Jerusalem. They had been scattered all over that region. But they were believers. And a lot of what he writes in First Peter, really he's trying to encourage them. And if you read throughout, he's trying to encourage them to be firm in their faith, in spite of all the sufferings that they are enduring. Right? So they had problems in their workplace. They had problems trying to get good jobs. Um, they were suffering persecu uh, persecution by people they were working for. Uh, all kinds of things they were suffering. So they were Jewish Christians, but they had been scattered out, out, of, out of Jerusalem. And he's encouraging them. And so if you look at First Peter, uh, you know, he, he, we can identify at least six situations where the believer is facing hardship. You know, one is, uh, he, if you look at the context here, there is injustice in the workplace. That was unfairness. Uh, second, they are being falsely accused for good conduct. Uh, they are suffering against sin. 
that is uh, like in relation to what we just talked about the suffering against sin they are suffering as a christian because they are christians they are being persecuted they are being uh, mocked at laughed at sometimes they are suffering because of their own actions meaning not doing bad but they are doing good but people don't like it why are you are speaking the truth you should tell lies you know why you are you know so this doing good but people are attacking their good actions uh, and they are suffering due to the adversary that is the devil so in first peter itself you can see six different reasons why christians are suffering in this world believers are suffering in this world right there is injustice false accusation against sin uh, because you are a christian because you are doing good and because of the devil so it's all these believers are facing hardships like because of these reasons and three out of these six are because of other people's actions you know the injustice the false accusation uh, the uh, uh, suffering because of a christian actually maybe even four of these are suffering due to our own actions by doing good we are suffering wrongfully so Peter is this is a good study first peter you know what do you do when you suffer wrongfully that means you are not done anything wrong but you're still suffering because other people are against you for whatever reason in that situation peter says you commit yourself to god who judges righteously don't fight don't punch them in the face <laughs> don't you don't retaliate you don't try to defend yourself he says be like jesus he was led like a sheep to the slaughter he never opened his mouth he set us an example that we should follow in his steps right and you just commit your situation to the lord and let god judge on your behalf that's what he says right so the fact is we will be suffering uh, for various situations but we need to understand that uh, you know we commit ourselves to god but at the same time from a practical standpoint we must uh, you know protect ourselves that means don't as far as possible don't let people abuse you misuse you something right so don't stay in that situation and say oh i'm suffering from god no get out of that situation protect yourself jesus himself said if they persecute you in, in bangalore go to hyderabad <laughs> <laughs> he didn't use the names of cities but he said if they persecute you in one city go to the other yeah so that means you protect yourself don't sit down there and say oh they're hitting me hitting me hitting you know they're hitting you yeah you go there <laughs> go to a place where you can be safe jesus himself said that right the point is there's nothing wrong if when you are being persecuted or you are being mistreated you move to a place of safety take care of yourself as far as possible there's nothing wrong with that and that's being wise okay uh, it's not a sign of fear it's not a sign of uh, why oh, don't want to suffer for christ no just take care of yourself because you're more useful to god when you're alive than when you're dead on earth when you're dead you go to heaven you can't serve god here on earth right so just take care of yourself and protect yourself um so we'll pause here we still have a few more to do i thought we'll finish this chapter today but <laughs> we'll finish um tomorrow uh, not tomorrow next week sorry what am i saying next week we'll finish it up next week um so next couple of weeks actually next two weeks i'll be um doing my classes from home uh, i need to stay home um yeah, because i have to take care of my dad his uh, you know, he needs he needs me there so i'll do my classes from home all right so i will be present in the spirit <laughs> absent in the flesh <laughs> yeah yeah i'll be talking like this we you ask us really but we should finish soon like we'll um we have um, four lectures yeah so i think we should finish we will definitely finish this chapter next week and then Uh, we have some um, uh, social issues that just topics I mentioned about those social issues, and then I'll set up an assignment for you to do. I'll cover everything. Okay, okay. Thank you, everyone. God bless.
Bye. See you next week.